Thank you, Vince. Um, I, is, yeah, I think I'm on. Yeah. So I uh, was asked to talk about breast cancer today and also to leave time for questions in case I don't cover areas that you're interested in. So my attempt will be to finish in about 40, 45 minutes and leave uh, 10, 15 minutes at the end for questions. If there's a burning question, feel free to interrupt. This is informal presentation. Uh, I want to start the presentation uh, where I'm going to end the presentation. So for the uh, non-radiologists in the room, I think you can tell this is an abdominal CT scan. Shown in the circle again for the non-radiologist is a, a tumor in this woman's abdomen. Uh, <coughs> shown here a month or so later is the, is the same region. And for those of you in the front, I think you can see there's, the tumor is gone. And this tumor disappeared because this woman was treated with a drug that was designed using knowledge of breast cancer genes, uh, not a drug that was used as a general tumor or an anti-growth um, agent, but a, a drug specifically designed to the genetic makeup of her tumor. Uh, I will, most of the talk will be about where the genetic and genomic advances can be implied to medicine. And I'm going to bring in examples uh, from breast cancer, some of which actually, and I'm sure some of you in the audience actually are applying them, and others that are still in clinical trials. Uh, but how did we get here, and what are we going to cover today? Uh, we're going to talk mostly about breast cancer genes, but as Vince mentioned, uh, especially for BRCA1 and BRCA2, these are also ovarian cancer genes, and I'm not going to cover that today, but they're very important components of ovarian cancer. In fact, some of the treatment data that I will show you comes from ovarian cancer rather than breast cancer. Uh, so we'll talk a bit about what these genes are how we find them and how we use genomics and, and genetics to get to these genes. What do these genes do in the body, at least some of them, the ones we know about? And then there'll be an overarching kind of woven theme of how we can use this genetic knowledge to improve health. I, I just want to start with showing you the data that I think everyone in this audience knows is the mortality by different causes between 1950 and around 2000. Uh, and the red bars are the mortality in 1950 for heart disease, stroke, uh, pneumonia, and cancer. And what you'll notice that's quite striking is that we made great progress in these areas uh, over the last 60 some years. Cancer, and, and it is unfair to lump all of cancer together, uh, but for the purpose of this graphic, we're putting all of cancer together. Progress has not been as impressive for cancer. Uh, one of the reasons is because we don't know the mechanism for the cancer. So the other is obviously there are lots of different types of cancer. Uh, I'm sure that everyone in this audience also appreciates that breast cancer is a very common disease. So unlike some genetic diseases which are, are rare, this disease has 200,000 cases or so per year, 40,000 deaths. Uh, the one in eight, one in nine number, if you're a woman, your lifetime risk of being diagnosed. Uh, less talked about is the fact if you're a female, your risk of death from breast cancer is a few percent uh, currently. This is what the cancer rates have looked like uh, for various cancers over the last uh, 70, 80 years. And shown in this yellow line is ovarian cancer, which is held relatively steady, although there's been improvements probably in diagnosis. Uh, Uterine cancer, nice example of advances in medicine, in this case mostly surgical treatment, decreasing cancer mortality by uh, a lot over this interval. Uh, breast cancer staying roughly the same over this interval in diagnosis, and probably our worst uh, experience as far as not a victory here is this great increase of lung cancer in women that obviously correlates with environmental exposure from smoke. Uh, if you zoom in on the breast cancer curves, and shown for reference on the bottom are the lung cancer curves. This is breast cancer over the last um, <coughs> 30 some years. And many of you will remember in this interval, there was great concern about these rising rates of breast cancer um, in the 80s. And it also corresponded with a great increase in awareness of breast cancer. Prior to this, breast cancer was not a high profile public disease, even though it was still a common disease. This rate seems to have leveled off. And if you look over here, and I'll zoom in on this area, this is a real decline uh, that started in the early, uh, early in 2000, 2003. And does anyone know what, what has been attributed to this decline in breast cancer? 
Right, so this is, the decline is attributed to the, the uh, decline in use of hormone replacement therapy. And that coincided with, uh, practically right there, with a, a landmark study that showed that hormone replacement therapy did not protect against heart disease. Uh, it was always known that it was slightly increased risk of breast cancer, but it was a, on balance thought to be a good thing if you protected you against heart disease, which was more common. Uh, at this point in time, HRT therapy dropped uh, through the floor as far as uh, uptake and probably can account for this decline in breast cancer risk. I bring this as an example not as to um, say we did the wrong thing, but an example to show you that in addition to genes, the environment's very important. So here we have medical practice influencing the rate of breast cancer and essentially decreasing it uh, through advanced studies. So why would we want to know about the genetics of breast cancer? There's uh, always a reason to look at mechanism to try to better understand a disease, but in breast cancer and ovarian cancer, we hope that looking at genetics will help us with prevention, early detection, being able to better uh, predict the course of the disease and tailor therapy. And so today, I'm actually going to talk about advances brought on by genetics in these two regions. There, there are advances in, in both of these other categories, but I don't have time to talk about them today, so I'm going to focus on these two areas during the talk. Before I do that, I want to uh, do one advertisement and one definition for you. you. You may have heard that cancer is a genetic disease. Uh, and I think it's well soaked into the, the culture now that cancer is a disease of genes. But you have to really divide this into two separate areas, and that's why we're having two lectures uh, and two talks on it. The first area that cancer and genes are involved is when cells essentially can acquire mutations that are associated with growth advantages, and they es escape normal controls and essentially form a tumor. This is a, a disease where the genome of the cells change. These are also known as somatic mutations. These are not inherited. Uh, they're not the topic of today. Uh, a month from now, Stan Lipwitz, who is here, if he raises his hand, will be talking about what we're learning and what we're uh, being able to do in medical practice by understanding the genetic makeup of the tumor itself. It's a critically important and probably one of the most active areas of, of cancer research is understanding the genome of the tumor. Today, what we're going to focus on is what comes before that, and that's the genome of the individual. So this is the genome that, they in, that you inherit from your parents that has a collection of genetic variants. Some of those variants increase your risk of cancer. So at birth, based on what you inherited from your parents, your risk of cancer from one person can be different from another. And that's going to be the focus of today's lecture. Come next month to hear Stan talking about the changes in tumors and tailoring drugs toward tumors. Uh, this is the inherited variation. I want to just, yes, can you see the chromosomes there? I, <laughs> they look a little washed out, but these are an example of how uh, risk mutations can occur in a cell. Here's two chromosomes, and I don't know if you can see this. What I've done is delete one portion of that gene. And that cell, since it has another copy, is probably fine. But if it loses the other portion of this gene, it now has no copies of this particular gene and will go on to uh, essentially form a tumor. This is what happens in sporadic cancer, where you lose <coughs> both copies of a particular gene. These are called up the top tumor suppressor genes. Uh, this happens uh, rarely, but since you have several trillion cells in your body, Occasionally, one cell suffers these two hits. This is what we think is going on in sporadic cancer. In inherited cancer, and again, I'm sorry, you can't, they're not dark enough to see. Here's the chromosome in a person with inherited cancer where they already have inherited a mutation or a, de a deletion or something that knocks out one copy of their gene. So now in all of their cells, all they have to do is lose the other copy. And that's a much more uh, common event. And so people who are born with one mutated allele have a much increased risk of, of a particular cancer. And this just shows you that the deletion of the other allele. For the most part, the cancer risk genes, the ones that are inherited, tend to fall into this category. And in fact, in 
we all know that family history is an important risk factor for, for all cancers, and especially breast and ovarian cancer. In a small percentage of families, the cancer really does appear to be inherited as a Mendelian trait. Uh, and so what does that look like? Oh, and, and that accounts for 3 to 8 percent of breast cancer, so not, a, not a ma the majority of breast cancer, a small amount of breast cancer, but a small amount of a very large number. And so what I'd like to do now is focus a little bit on our understanding of the topography of breast cancer risk. And this kind of foggy, cloudy slide shows you where we were about 10 years ago. I'm going to very quickly get to the identification of the breast cancer genes, work that took about 15 years, um, and really that could be done now probably in, in a few months with the right families uh, due to advances in the genomic technologies and genomics. So what does the topography of breast cancer risk look like? Well, if you focus in on this graph for a second, this is the frequency, the frequency of the risk. So up here, 30 percent frequency of risk would be quite high, a fraction of a percent down here. And this is the relative risk. So essentially, if you have a particular variant, if you inherit a particular variant from your parent, how much does that increase your risk compared to someone who didn't inherit the variant? And so what we can do is map the landscape. First of all, there's boundaries that can be put in. So down here, where there are things that are very uncommon and very low risk, they probably exist, but we, don't, we can't find them because it requires studies of enormous uh, size to find them. There's an upper boundary to this map up here in that we know that there aren't super high risk variants out there in the population that are incredibly common. Because if they were, then breast cancer would be even more common than it is. And so the, the genetic variants have to fall into this landscape. And what do they look like? So this is what a, a diagram of a sporadic cancer. Here's a woman with breast cancer. Is this familial? There's cancer in the family. Is it familial? Not because this person is not a blood relative even though it's cancer in the family and so this is uh, finding out that you have an aunt or an uncle with, family, with a family history is not the same as mapping out the pedigree. This is a relatively common manifestation. We know that empirically that if this woman had breast cancer, this woman who might be interested in knowing what her risk is, her risk is doubled just based on their pedigree alone. This is the picture of inherited cancer. Here are the field circles again are women who have had breast cancer. And you can see multiple individuals in the bloodline. I illustrate this particular pedigree because uh, those of you that uh, have looked at genetics, this is, looks almost like a dominant pattern of inheritance with one exception. What about this guy? Does he have the risk allele? I see nodding. He almost certainly does, but he doesn't have the cancer because this, there's a, a sex-limited trait for this particular cancer. So we have heard from um, time to time of people being told, don't worry about your cancer risk because it's all on your father's side. And certainly there's no uh, empirical reason to, to worry about um, which side of the family comes. If there's cancer on one side of the family, that counts as increased inherited risk. So obviously this woman would really want to know what her cancer risk is. And, it, and your gut tells you that her cancer risk is probably a lot more than this woman's cancer risk, and that is true. Using these families, we're able to identify the genes that cause the high risk of cancer. And how was this done? Shown here is the curve of rate of breast cancer and age of diagnosis. So as you might expect, very little cancer is diagnosed early in life. Breast cancer is, is clearly mostly a disease of later in life. If you want to find the genetic basis for any particular condition, would it be best to look at the average presentation, or is it better to look at the more severe or earlier onset presentation? And so clearly, the more severe and earlier onset is likely to have more of a genetic component. Because as you get later in life, the combination of your genes and environment tend to tip toward environmental influences. Earlier in life, it's more genetic influences. And so to identify the major genes for breast cancer, what was done is women who were diagnosed at very early ages in these families were looked at. And that led to the discovery um, now 
uh, I think it was 1994, sounds like a long time ago, of the BRCA1 gene or breast cancer gene 1. Uh, soon after, when these families <coughs> that had lots of cancer were typed, we realized that BRCA1 did not account for all of the families. And so very quickly, within a year after BRCA2 was identified, these, remain, these two genes remain the major players for high-risk families in high-risk breast cancer. Uh, when you study families that have breast cancer only, and you ascertain breast cancer only, you don't notice it, that they, there are other cancers in the families until you start looking at, at family history. And very soon after the, the genes were identified, or the, that there were breast cancer genes were identified, it was appreciated that there are other cancer associated with. So BRCA1 and BRCA2 are associated with roughly an eight-fold increase of risk. So if your risk is one in, one in nine, one in eight, and goes up eight-fold, it gets up to be pretty high. It's also, BRCA1 mutations are also affiliated with breast cancer in males, which is an, a rare but not incredibly uh, uncommon disease. About 1% of breast cancer that's diagnosed is diagnosed in men. Ovarian cancer, as I mentioned at the beginning, is a very major player for especially those with BRCA1 mutations in that carrying a BRCA1 mutation increases a woman's risk over ovarian cancer 20 to 30 times, sometimes 40 times, depending on how you measure it. Had the studies been done differently, BRCA1 probably would have been called an ovarian cancer gene. Uh, and in men who carry mutations in this gene, they're at twofold increased risk of prostate cancer. That's been replicated a number of times. So these breast cancer genes are also other cancer genes as well. Where do they fit in, the, in our topographic map of the landscape? They fall up in here. Uh, BRCA1 and 2, the, the number of people who carry mutations are quite rare. Probably, looking around, only one or two people in this room might carry variants, or, uh, deleterious variants in these genes. But they're very strong risk factors, so they're up here. The other gene that is up there is the P53 gene, which is involved in Lee Fraumini syndrome, which has other cancers involved in breast, in breast cancer. Uh, so these, these genes, very potent risk factors for breast cancer risk. What, are the, what did the lesions in these genes look like? I'm, this is a slide that was originally made in December of 94. Uh, I can tell you I made it as a slide. I think some of you probably remember slides. Uh, <laughs> and had to scan it in. Uh, and shown on this line is a picture of the BRCA1 gene. And it was identified two months earlier, published in Science two months earlier. And all these arrows show you where mutations have been found in this gene in different families. And I think you can appreciate with, within two months, we realized that these genes were going to have a lot of mutations. Uh, the, this is the untranslated part, so the gray area is the part that makes the protein. And so the protein is being hit all over the place in all the different families. So the families that I showed you, this it's extensive pedigree, in general, they tend to have different mutations from one another, with a ex few exceptions that I'll talk about in a second. This has led to, um, as many of you know, a, a genetic testing made available in the US uh, almost exclusively by Myriad Genetics uh, to find out who carries mutations for this gene. And if you do the calculation, these two genes are probably the most sequenced genes in the entire genome. So worldwide, there's probably been uh, 250, 300,000 individuals who have had their genes sequenced. So we know a lot about the different variants in the gene. Uh, this is an updated picture of the gene, a little more colorful now on the web uh, from our database. This is just, again, the gene at the bottom. Shown here are where the mutations are. There are so many mutations in this gene that some of the nucleotides have been changed to, uh, you know, there's four, four different possibilities at each nucleotide. If it's originally a T, we found that T has changed to a C and also to a G. So we've almost hit a kind of saturation of this gene. What you also will appreciate from this is that there's no hot spots. There was no insight into function from looking at the mutation distribution. For some genes, in fact, maybe some that Stan will talk about, there are hot spots in the, that show how they're activating mutations. This is a gene that uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 produces a risk by losing its function. Uh, as I said, there are lots of different mutations, but there are some groups which have the same mutation due to a founder effect. And this is just due to common ancestry. One that we've worked on is the Ashkenazi Jewish individuals. 
who have uh, one BRCA1 mutation, another BRCA1 mutation, and a BRCA2 mutation. So in aggregate, one in 40 Ashkenazi Jews carries a deleterious mutation in the BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes. Uh, we used this effect um, uh, more than a decade ago to do a study of, and I don't know if, it, did anyone participate in the Washington area study? Uh, to try to figure out what the risk was associated with this, and it was carried out in the Bethesda community. Uh, in Iceland, there is one BRCA2 mutation that is found in one of 170 people in Iceland. There are Dutch founder mutations. There are founder mutations in these different areas of the world. This has the effect in that if you're going to get a genetic test for BRCA1 and you're in a group that has founder mutations, it makes more sense to look for that first before moving on to the more expensive test. I can tell you that the full sequencing test now approaches $4,000 uh, uh, of a charge in the, in the US, Myriad Genetics. The test for specific mutations is quite uh, a bit cheaper, a few hundred dollars. If you look at the mutation types, and don't worry too much about the, the different kinds of types, just look at the total number of entries. So there, there's, as Vince mentioned, there are thousands and thousands of different mutations in these genes. Distinct alterations means the different mutations. So there's nonsense mutations which shut the protein off. There's, at the time I took, made this slide, there's about 176 different uh, nonsense mutations. But the ones that are found in one family only are 84. So in each case, there's a lot of different mutations and about half of them are found in a single family. This is why you have to test almost every new family because they, about half of them have something we haven't seen before. The top three rows are mutations that we know kill the protein. So if a woman has, uh, is found to have, or a family is found to have a nonsense of frame shift or a splicing mutation, we can reliably tell them that that mutation is probably associated with risk. You know, it's how I'm hedging a bit. Uh, the other case where there are missense changes, these are changes that change one amino acid for another. So they, proteins, these proteins are very big. They're over 1,000 amino acids. You swap one amino acid for another, we have a hard time with those. And this has been called the unclassified variant problem or the variance of unknown significant problem. And so in BRCA1, there have been almost 3,000 families that have had these. There's 500 different mutations. About 300 or so have been found only in one family. And when the people get these test results, they're told, you have a variant. We don't know what it means. Um, and sorry about that. And that's a, a very active area of research because when you go to get a diagnostic test, if you have the pretest counseling, you're prepared for getting a, either a good result that you don't carry something bad or a bad result that you do carry something bad. It's harder to prepare people for uh, we have something interesting, but we don't know what it means. And roughly about 10% of test results, 5 to 10% of test results, turn up one of these variants uh, that we just don't know the significance of. Uh, and so there's a very active uh, group trying to nail these down, figure out how many of them are deleterious and how many of them aren't. I, I bring this up because, as you'll hear in, in, in other talks, and you may have heard from Dave Valley in the first talk, we're going to be sequencing lots and lots of genes going forward. The sequencing technology has become so spectacular that it's very easy to generate DNA sequence information. We have to be prepared for generating information that we don't understand. So that's a quick summary of the high penetrance, meaning they have a very strong effect, but low frequency genes. And again, BRCA1 and BRCA2 are the major players. P53 produces lee fraumeni syndrome, which is usually not confused for just breast cancer syndrome. What about the low penetrance, meaning the low risk, but high prevalence area? And so these may have a low relative risk. If you carry the variant, it only increases your risk of cancer a little bit. But they may have a high population attributable risk because lots of individuals carry them. Can we find those genes? I told you that to find these genes, individuals recruited very spectacular families and used the families to look via something called linkage analysis to find the genes. For these genes, we do what's called association studies. In association studies, linkage studies are relatively complicated. Association studies are very easy. You just do case control type studies. You look at people who have 
uh, the disease, match people who don't have the disease, and you count up how many variants are present or how many uh, genes are present in one versus the other. This is just an example of one that was done quite some time ago to give you an idea of the scale. You could identify the BRCA1 and 2 gene by having 20 nicely co <coughs> collected families. Uh, you, could, you could identify those genes. In order to identify these low penetrance genes, you need large numbers of cases and controls. And this, I show you the raw data to give you an idea. Controls about a half a percent carry it, and the cases about 2% carry it. And so you're looking for something of relatively modest effect. In this case, about a doubling of risk. There are now genes that have been filled into this area. So these are relatively more common than BRCA1, but still around 1 to 2%. And there's a collection of genes in that area that we now know about in this landscape. So the genes listed in here have rare, relatively rare variants that are associated with roughly a doubling of risk. That still leaves this big area down here. And that's an area that's been filled in most recently by what we call uh, whole genome association studies or genome-wide association studies. This just shows you an example. As you compare the frequency of, in some cases, a million markers in your cases compared to your controls. And certain markers, this is a, the p-value plotted in, in an inverse scale, certain markers show out to, to be standing out that they're much more common in your cases compared to your controls. Uh, this has been done for breast cancer. Uh, the first one was published in 2007. You'll see that the scale gets to be quite large because you now need to pool lots and lots of cases. So there's, there were 147 institutional affiliations on this paper. This is the first big association study of breast cancer risk. Um, and that has allowed us to fill in this region of the graph. It's likely that there'll be more and more variants that show up in here. Again, they have a very modest risk, 30% increase, a 20% increase. Uh, remember that having a family history, uh, first degree relative, is a 100% increase. So they're very modest. They're in the scale of um, uh, risk that's associated with certain diet choices and, and alcohol intake. So how can we use this now landscape? And this will be filled in a little bit more, but I don't expect. We're, we're pretty sure there are no more genes up here. We'll probably have a few more here. This area will get populated with some more. Uh, but we now are starting to have the entire picture of what the genetic landscape of breast cancer risk looks like. And so we now have a very clear picture. How can we use it? The first that I'd like to talk about is early detection. Early detection is the product of screening. And that's generally probably using these and these. And so if we go back to this family, it's pretty obvious if this family has an inherited cancer, whether or not we know they have a BRCA1 and 2 mutation. This woman's surveillance and screening uh, methods cannot be what we suggest for the population. And so what is normally suggested is that mammography is done more frequently, started earlier, depending a bit on the family history um, in these individuals. And pro uh, prophylactic surgery is considered uh, as well. How early? How, uh, it's as early as 20-something in some families. Um, I don't think there's a uniform recommendation. There are, uh, the standard that's been used is that the earliest, 10 years earlier than the earliest diagnosis in the family has been used at some point. So if, if this woman was diagnosed at age 30, then you might push it to 20. Um, so that's much earlier than you would do in the population. The risk that these women face has been estimated originally up to 90%. By looking at different study types, the risk, if you carry a mutation of having breast cancer, it ranges depending upon how you do the study. And this just lets us know that there's some heterogeneity in the mutations. And so right now, women who carry a BRCA1 mutation are generally told they have a 50 to 50 to 80 percent or 50 to 70 percent lifetime risk of breast cancer. Um, so I think we're getting a good handle on these high-risk families, but they tend to be rare. What about the low penetrance, high prevalence? Um, what about the clinical, are they clinically significant? And I think the answer is we don't know yet. 
Uh, are they significant to the individual health? We're not totally sure about that yet, but could they be used as a public health uh, style application of medicine? And for that, I want to show you uh, some modeling that's been done by Paul Farrow in, in the UK. How do we do breast cancer screening now? You reach a certain age, you start mammography. Um, you do a self-exam. Uh, and the assumption is that everyone of a certain age has an equal risk. Okay, so that's plotted here, that if you're a 50-year-old woman and I, I screen 20% of the population, I will catch 20% of the cancer. If I screen 100% of the population, I should catch 100% of the cancer. That's based on the idea that all 50-year-old women or all 40-year-old women have the same cancer risk. We know that that's probably not the case. This is what risk probably looks like in the population. If I again go back to my entire population of 1,000 40-year-old women, some of them will be at very low risk due to their genetic makeup. Others will be, sorry, others will be at very high risk. And risk is distributed in the population. Uh, genetic risk is distributed in the population almost like a normal distribution. So if we go back to our screening algorithm, and instead of making this assumption, this is what a, a bell curve would look like of risk, we assume that risk is not randomly distributing the population, but we can identify who is at higher risk. If you, could if you could implement screening programs that took this into account, and you screened the 20% of individuals who are most at risk, you would then pick up 60 to 70% of the, the cancers that way. This is not something we're ready to do. We don't know exactly how to employ the genetics yet, but it is the potential for where genetic risk assessment can be done. And this is genetic risk assessment can be done at any time in your life. Presumably, if we could sequence your genome uh, early on, we could give you a profile uh, at a very early age of what that might be like. Well, I'm not saying that we have to do this, but if you are going to employ resources that are relatively scarce and expensive, you might want to use the genetic risk profiles to guide them. The second area that, that these knowledge of these genes is having uh, impact already is in the tailored therapy. The data I'll present are, are really from clinical trials. They're not yet part of practice, uh, but they rely on our knowledge that BRCA1 and BRCA2 are actually DNA repair proteins. So your, every cell in your body has a, a genome in it. That genome is constantly having mutations and constantly under attack, your cells, and the cells of actually all, all organisms, have a very elaborate set of proteins and, and um, <coughs> gene products that are designed to repair that DNA. It took about a decade of work to recognize that that's what these two genes do in the uh, cell. In fact, they actually participate in a very specific type of DNA repair called double-strand break repair. So you could imagine, think about DNA as a double-stranded molecule. If you break one strand, it's still attached by its connection by the overlapping. But if you break both strands, those molecules are free to drift apart. <coughs> and the cell cannot tolerate very many double-stranded breaks at all. And BRCA1 and 2 seem to be involved in, in double-strand break repair. Keeping that in mind, a group in the, in the UK thought very logically and said, how can I use that fact to design a therapy? And so I mentioned that any kind of insult can do DNA damage. In fact, oxidation does DNA damage. So if you want to have your DNA be completely intact, you should stop breathing, which is not, some, not really an option. Uh, every time a cell divides, it introduces mutations. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of DNA damage going on. Almost all the time, it's repaired quite efficiently. So in normal cells, it's repaired, and the cell is viable. Uh, these things just show you the different types of repair. If you don't have BRCA1 in a cell or BRCA2, you have a defect in one type of repair, this double-stranded break repair. If you take a, another product out of the mix called uh, PARP, you don't have a, a type of DNA repair that repands single-stranded breaks. If you don't have either of these, then the cell dies. And so what the group in the UK did was design an agent that inhibits these enzymes. And so normal cell is okay. If I inhibit this enzyme, I'm fine. If I in inhibit BRCA1, I'm viable, although it might be a tumor. Uh, 
but if I knock out both of those, the cell is dead. And in a person, because you remember that these are tumor suppressor genes, the only cells that are missing completely BRCA1 are the tumor cells. And so if you add this extra layer, you ended up killing the tumor cells and the tumor cells only. That was the theory. Yeah? Is the BRC um, at risk for all insults to DNA, or is it more specific to specific insults? It's more specific to these double-stranded breaks. Um, in fact, there are, you can insult DNA a, a thousand ways. Uh, mutations as well as backbone breaks, but it is very, seems to be very specific for double-stranded breaks. And so it, this may be a little bit of a difficult scheme to follow, uh, but did it work? And so shown here is experimental data where these are tumors implanted into mice that are, are either have BRC, BRCA2 or don't have BRCA2. And I'll, I'll not go through all of the data, but these are the tumors that kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger in all the control mice and all the, the mice that were treated, uh, except for the ones that were missing BRCA2. So the treatment plus BRCA2 made the tumors go away in mice. And this was work that was published several years ago, it was somewhat fast-tracked into clinical trials, and I'll just show you some of the data from the clinical trials. So this is um, Olaparib, which is, again, this PARP inhibitor. There are several um, PARP inhibitors out on uh, in various clinical trials. This one seems to have had the most success. And the blue line here are those that weren't treated. Here's the treatment regimen. The red line was treated. So you can see that there's progression-free survival. is essentially better in those treated with this drug that has relatively minimal side effects compared to normal chemotherapy. There's a second trial published um, last year. No, from where I'm sitting, these don't look very good, but here, this is an ovarian cancer. People having uh, another PARP inhibitor on top of standard therapy, and again, showing an effect of the drug tailored toward the, the gene mutation. These uh, trials are still going forward. For breast cancer, there's been less success, uh, and it may be due to heterogeneity for breast cancer. There's a lot of excitement in the ovarian cancer world. Um, for using these to treat ovarian cancer because, again, many more ovarian cancers have BRCA mutations and many more ovarian cancers are more BRCA-like than they are breast cancers. I think the company, the, one of the compounds is an AstraZeneca compound. Uh, I think they were quite disappointed in the breast cancer results because it's obviously for them it's a larger market than the ovarian cancer. I think if you have ovarian cancer, you'd be pretty excited about anything that might be uh, an advance in treatment. Uh, from what I've heard, these are being used essentially now off-label, even though the clinical trials aren't done. Um, and I don't know if any of you in the room have experience with any of these PARP inhibitors. But I just want to close with showing you that these results, again, were driven by the genetics. Uh, understanding the genetic mechanism, understanding what the genes do, have had an influence on the, the way to target these tumors. Um, and so by understanding mechanism and re refining the characterization of the pathways, been able to rationally design drugs to help treat the tumors. I think that I've told you that we can use, in theory, use this knowledge of genetics of breast cancer to tailor early detection methods. Um, prevention is still somewhat up in the air. I think that many people reject prophylactic mastectomy as a preventative measure, uh, but it does prevent breast cancer in BRCA1. Um, BRCA2 families as well as oophorectomy. Uh, there are some advances that have been had in prognosis in knowing who has a BRCA1 and, and 2 mutation. And I think a lot of the excitement that's it's been in the last couple of years has been in the tailored therapy. And, and with that, I'd like to close and thank you for your attention. I promised that I would <laughs> leave time for questions. Uh, it kind of overpowers the other. Uh, so the question was, if you look at environmental risk factors, reproductive history, um, alcohol, dietary exposure, obesity, uh, do the BRCA1 synergize with those environmental risks? And I think synergy is probably not there. Um, it tends to overpower it. There, are, there have been some studies done uh, where uh, 
oral contraceptive use seems to be a little bit more powerful of a protection in individuals who have BRCA1 data, but it's not been great, very large studies. So they tend to be really overpowering risk factors. As much as we would like to say that we could remove some environmental um, exposure and, and make breast cancer go away, I, I don't think we can. I think it's the internal en environment. Right, so it, the question was, what about HRT, hormone replacement therapy? And I think from the, it, it's not suggested or recommended for um, people who carry the, the high prevalence mutations and probably not recommended or suggested for almost anyone now given the, the breast cancer risk and the lack of cardiac protection. Um, you said the contraceptive is protective, but HRT is uh, uh, against, I mean, this is this. Is that right? Sorry, I didn't hear the last part. You said the contraceptives, oral pills, are protective, is that what you said earlier? Uh, the contraceptive, oral contraceptives used early are, are somewhat protective from some epidemiologic data. And the HRT is harmful? Later in life, yeah. Okay. Yes. One follow-up. Yeah. <laughs> Why is this being so sensitive, so twitchy? So the... The question is, why is this gene so sensitive? I don't think the gene is sensitive. Um, I, we have a lot of mutations going on in our body. Uh, the gene shows a pattern of mutations that is consistent with just internal environment causing mutations. Some of these mutations, and I, the founder mutations, some of those mutational events actually happened two, 3,000 years ago. Uh, and are just carried through because the breast cancer, as, as awful as it is, is not something that interferes for the most part with reproduction. So it's not necessarily selective at, uh, disadvantage to having cancer, cancer as a whole um, in that realm. If a young woman uh, with very strong family history is going to have repeated mammogram, is it better to do MRI rather than a mammogram? The, the current recommendation is to do MRI, not, not necessarily because of the radiation risk, which has always been theoretical and controversial, uh, because radiation causes double strand, can cause double-stranded breaks in women who potentially may have their double-stranded break repair compromised. Uh, the studies that have been done that I'm aware of show that the MRI is just more sensitive uh, and detects earlier lesions. And so that's why they're shifting toward that recommendation uh, in BRCA1 or, or uh, positive family history How families. Often yeah, I don't know the current, and maybe Stan, do you know? Or they, I don't know the current I I ASCO recommendations as to interval. Um, well, I think you would do it annually and then follow up as, as indicated. So, a normal mammogram would trigger an annual or a normal MRI would trigger an MRI a year later, an abnormal one might cause a six month I do know there's a lot of diversity. Some of these families, the women show up every six months um, because <laughs> they're very nervous uh, about their risk. I, I think the da hardcore data on efficacy is somewhat slim. This question over there. So the, the question is, are there correlations between the individual, or I can say the germline, the inherited profile, and the oncotype type testing, which actually looks at the expression levels in the tumors themselves? And there are some correlations in that the phenotypes, of, especially in BRCA1, of the tumors 
uh, tend to correlate with the mutation a little bit. I don't know in clinical care whether it makes any difference. So BRCA1 tumors tend to be the tr more the triple negative, uh, essentially a estrogen re receptor uh, a, uh, <coughs> negative type tumors. They probably show up on the oncotype test as, as well. My guess is that if you had the germline knowledge and the oncotype test, the oncotype test would kind of overrule the germline knowledge. You might predict the oncotype test result from knowing the germline, but you really want to know what's going on in the particular tumor. And that's a case where I think what's going on in the tumor at the time you actually run the test is probably more important uh, than the actual germline constitution. A lot of triple negative, a lot of basal tumors occur in women who are not BRSA1 positive. Uh, and so knowing BRSA1 <coughs> status alone is not enough. This question in the back? So the question is when I'm talking about increased risk in BRSA1 or 2, am I talking about heterozygous or homozygous? Uh, and it's an excellent question because the, it's really a little bit of both. The inheritance is heterozygous in that the person inherits one mutated copy and has one good copy. So in that case, the person is a heterozygote. What we think happens is that the tumor loses the other copy and becomes homozygous for it. But really when we're talking about risk, we're talking about the heterozygotes. If you have two mutations in BRSA1, in one in your maternal and one in your paternal chromosome, you probably are not viable. And so mice uh, are, le th those mutations you can make in mice and follow, they're lethal. In BRSA2, they're mostly lethal. There is one exception. There are some mutations that you can have in BRCA2 where you've got two alleles, so you're homozygous for mutation. And that produces a different phenotype called Fanconi anemia, which is usually identified through other reasons in the childhood time. So for the most part, one, carrying one mutated chromosome increases your risk, and we're talking about it in the heterozygous state. Right, so I have a follow-up. Mm -hmm. So does that, can you be heterozygous for both? So the question is, can, can you have a one, have you a heterozygote for a BRC1 and heterozygote for a BRC2 mutation? <laughs> and the answer is yes. Uh, that's been documented most in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, where you have 1% of one and 1% 1 of the other. Uh, in the general population, so you'd expect one in 10,000 individuals to have both, and it's found at about that rate. So there's probably not synergy in that you don't have worse disease, but there's only been a very, very small number of people documented who have that. So it's a little bit hard to say with any conclusion, but there have been people who have a heterozygote mutation in BRCA1 and a heterozygote mutation in BRCA2, but they're rare. Mm -hmm. um, a woman told me yesterday that her mother and her sister are BRC one or two positive, and she is it. So does she have an increased risk of breast cancer over the population? And excuse my ignorance, but is this a test that you do just once in your lifetime, or can people uh, mutate later in life and you have to test again? So the question was if a woman who comes from a family where her mother and her sister carry the BRCA1 mutation, a specific one, and she's tested and she doesn't carry it, is her risk higher, or is it the population risk? It is probably almost certainly infinitely closer to the population risk. Can we say it's not a little bit higher? No, but generally the, the surveillance and the screening recommendations drop down to the population risk. <coughs> and the second part of the question was, do I have to get tested once or can mutations happen later? And so these are inherited mutations. We test them in the blood, even though the, the, your blood DNA, even though it's not your blood that's the affected tissue, and you really should only have to do it once. Comment on the use of CT scans of the thorax as a risk factor. I'm going to defer to the radiologist. The, the question was, could you comment on the use of CT scans of the chest and the risk of, risk. of radiation? Yeah. Well, this is this is a very hot topic right now, obviously, um, and I kind of have it in two camps of, are the ways that I think about it. One camp are the people who um, they have a symptom or an issue or they already have cancer or some other, other problem and they're getting a CT scan to answer a specific question um, that will have an immediate diagnostic or therapeutic impact. The risk of radiation for those patients, I think, is 
uh, and, and by the way, it's based on extrapolated data. We don't, we don't really know what that risk is. We, we think we know based on extrapolated data, but, but nobody really knows what that risk is. Those people, in my mind, their risk of developing cancer in 25 years is marginal compared to the benefit that they're going to gain by having an exam. The second camp are people who are having exams that we think are maybe um, not such great use. People who have um, total body screening, for example, I have strongly, strongly discouraged this because uh, there is no data to show that, that there are improved outcomes for these patients. Um, and obviously they're getting, they're getting radiation um, that they would not otherwise have. There's a, there's a certain amount of CT scanning that is done, um, particularly in patients who are seen in the emergency department. Uh, and, and it happens because of the, the pressures in that department to diagnose and, uh, and move patients quickly. And I think we could do a little bit more with better utilization in those patients um, and decrease their potential risk by having CT scan. Um, but that, that's a, a much bigger problem that, that we can't solve on an individual basis. And, and that is a problem that will have to be addressed more globally as to what is considered appropriate utilization. There are a lot of factors right now going into what is considered appropriate utilization. Um, there's a whole liability set against what we know as best practices. And, and that's gonna get worked out over the next, I'd say, five to, to 10 years. As, uh, as healthcare reform happens. But if you have patients who have real problems and you need diagnostic information, so this is where you have an impact on, on diagnosis and treatment, and the patient is 30 years old, I, I certainly wouldn't not have a CT scan of the chest because of the potential radiation to the breast in that example. But for the smoker, it's a CT that they recommend, a CT of the chest or the smoker. Well, there's all the new information showing the utilization of screening CT. And by the way, all of our machines now and, and the way we set up our protocols are set up to minimize radiation but still be um, of diagnostic accuracy. There's a difference in imaging of what is um, diagnostically accurate and what is a pleasing image to the eye. And if you use more radiation, you get a very pleasing image. It may not have any more diagnostic accuracy than the very grainy, noisy looking image. Um, so there's a lot of sensitivity right now to using factors um, in, in the scanning parameters to minimize the dose of radiation but still have diagnostic accuracy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.